So each year in Formula One, we normally see one, two, three, maybe even four new drivers on the grid. And in 2023, we had three of them. First off, Oscar Piastri, who had himself a decent year at McLaren. Then Logan Sargent, driving for Williams and spending most of the year working out what the duck a kilometre is. And then finally, we had Nick De Vries, brought in to the Red Bull Junior team Alpha Tauri to drive alongside Yuki Tsunoda, creating one of F1's shortest driver lineups. Probably the only thing shorter was Nick's career in F1. But why exactly was it cut so short? Well, that's what we're about to find out as we see just how bad Nick De Vries was in Formula One. So before entering F1, Nick De Vries competed in F2 as a Mercedes Junior the highest tier of junior racing to Formula 1, with his first season in 2017 finishing behind the likes of Charles Leclerc. But hey, Charles has become one of the best F1 drivers on the grid, one of the best qualifiers for sure. Okay, he may not have figured out quite how to convert those poles to wins, but still, one of the best. So there's no shame in Nick being beaten by him. After all, it's not like anyone else significant was ahead as well. Oh dear. But hey, only his rookie season. Into 2018 and Nick would now be up against the likes of Alex Albon, along with Lando Norris and George Russell, both of them rookies. And all three of them beat Nick, meaning it would be another year in F2 for the Dutchman, this time in 2019. And then finally, at the third time of asking, he clinched the title, beating out fierce competition from, um, oh. So in summary, F2, not the most amazing, which is probably why instead of being promoted to Formula 1, he went to Formula Washing Machine, sorry, Formula E. That and the fact that Williams needed all the cash from Nicholas Latifi that they could get. However, De Vries and driving for the Mercedes Formula E team, you could say it went pretty well, only going and winning it at the first time of asking. So that meant Nick was now a Formula 2 champion and a Formula E champion. And in the 2022 season, he had another chance to showcase his skills, this time, in an F1 car, as when Alex Albon's appendix exploded, okay that might be a slight exaggeration, but at the 2022 Italian Grand Prix a replacement was needed, so Nick stepped in for Williams, not only doing a good job but also scoring points. And so when at the end of the year when Alpha Tauri was in need of a driver to replace Pierre Gasly, they chose Nick De Vries. Yep, he was that good looking of a talent at the time that Red Bull chose the Mercedes affiliated driver over all their juniors, which then in 2023 brings us nicely onto Formula 1. Starting with Bahrain and after the team were done trying to get him to drive into Lando Norris, we could get into qualifying, where he qualified in 19th place, 1.128 seconds or 1.24% away from first, and just one place behind fellow rookie Piastri. So far, so okay. Into the race then, where overall he kept it pretty clean, battling with the likes of Joe and Hulkenberg for most of the race and finishing in P14 ahead of both of them. Admittedly, 30 seconds back from teammate Sonoda, but still, approximately 16 laps ahead of Charles Leclerc. So, you know. Plus, no incidents, unlike Esteban Ocon, who spent that entire race collecting five second penalties like they were trading cards. So P14 in the first race, it gets a good grade. On to Saudi Arabia then, and Circuit de la Spoon, with Nick avoiding and then getting past Lewis Hamilton, while in practice. We're talking about practice. Not a game, not a game, not a game. We're talking about practice. Into qualifying though, and Nick's first lap went well, until turn one, where he locked the rears and spun a full 180. But hey, even Fernando Alonso did that, so clearly he's just taking after the world champs. Onto his lap though, and it got him all the way to P18, and only really because Sargent spun out and Norris hit the wall. This time 1.483 seconds and 1.67% away from P1. Into the race then, and once again, not too much of note, he spent most of his time driving with Logan Sargent, eventually finishing ahead, and once again in P14, and this time only 10 seconds behind teammate Sonoda. I mean, there was a safety car halfway through due to Lance Stroll's dying race car, but still, a similar-ish weekend to that in Bahrain, meaning as a rookie in his second race, it gets a good grade. On to Australia now. Oh, there, there, that's better. In practice, and besides some of his bodywork looking for a new job as a kite, it was pretty uneventful. Well, less eventful than Yuki Tsunoda's, that's for sure. On to qualifying, and thanks to Sergio Perez for getting how to drive, a real theme of 2023, Nick had snuck through into Q2, 
I mean, that's as far as he went, staying in 15th place, but this time only three places behind teammate Sonoda, so for qualifying at least, it was pretty good. The race, however, not so much, as while the first start was okay and incident free, once Alex Albon had finished throwing his Williams at the wall, well, we had another. Another one. With Nick electing to just sort of drive over Esteban Ocon. And from there, he spent most of this one pretty much last. He did, however, get a chance late on though, as with Kevin Magnussen's rear right tyre understandably deciding it wanted no further part in the Haas team, we had another red flag. Not another one? Which Nick used to swiftly gain a place on Logan Sargent, who was having none of it promptly ploughing into the back of De Vries' Alpha Tauri and knocking them both out of the race, meaning our little Dutchman finished P15 DNF instead of, well, just P15. And so on the whole, with instants all over the place and driving mostly last, it's Nick's first bad weekend. Moving on to Azerbaijan and now the first sprint weekend, and with only one practice session, qualifying would be crucial. He really needed a good... Ah, as at the very first opportunity, the Dutchman took his Alpha Tauri and planted it headfirst into the barriers. But hey, there was still the sprint shootout, where he finished over 3 seconds from safety, and 5.36 seconds from the top. Admittedly, Logan Sargent had pulled a nick and now had his car looking more lopsided than the leaning tower of Pisa, but that meant that De Vries couldn't set a final lap. But still, P20 plus 5.36 seconds is what the record shows. So sprint time now, and the weekend did start to look a little better, back in his favourite P14 and a decent mini race overall. But now, time for the big race, and things started off okay, until just lap 10, where our boy here clipped the wall, broke the front suspension, and had to retire there and then. And so his weekend went from bad to worse, back to bad, and now just a million miles down the gutter. And so, after two straight good weekends, it's now back to back bad ones. Kinda like watching Tottenham playing football, really. Next up, Miami, aka Circuit Florida Man, and once again, we're talking about instants in practice. We're talking about practice. As while navigating the world's slowest right-hander, Nick managed to spin his car through 180 degrees. On to qualifying, and it's safe to say, best so far. Not only making it into Q2, but for the first time out qualifying teammate Sonoda. He's done it! I wouldn't cheer too long though. As come race day, it only took not even one corner for things to go wrong, as the Dutchman forgot that F1 cars have these things called brakes, and so drove straight into the back of Lando Norris in front of him, with Nick then spending the rest of the race running around last of the healthy cars, 25 seconds away from Sonoda, who was busy almost scoring points. As after his best qualifying, the Sunday was thrown away, like trash to the curbside or more accurately thrown away like Nikita Mazepin from the Haas team. So while yes, Saturday was good, that Sunday is too disappointing for it not to be a bad weekend. Next up, we have Imola. Never mind, we don't have Imola. Next up instead, we have Monaco, a race that usually gives watching paint dry and counting sheep a run for their money as things that send you to sleep. However, this year was slightly different, as after an instant free practice, something Lewis Hamilton couldn't boast, Nick had his best qualifying of the year, P12 at the track where it really mattered most, and just half a tenth away from Q3. On to race day then, and as per usual, it was quite the parade to start off with, until lap 50 or so, when the rain started falling, with everyone changing over to intermediate tyres, except Ferrari who were doing nothing. This weather though caught out many drivers, including Sainz off the track, and George Russell also off the track but not Nick. As for him, it was a case of slow and steady, wins the P12. I mean, you didn't expect more than that, did you? Still, a result like that ahead of his teammates and a good qualifying to boot, definitely back with a good weekend. Next up, we have Spain, also known as the race that each year does its best to steal the crown of most boring away from Monaco. And in 2023, was no exception, as once Nick had safely navigated the traffic in Free Practice 3, We're talking about practice. He did the same joke about three times already. I don't think it's funny anymore. It was time for qualifying, with De Vries electing to turn himself into a Beyblade, not once but twice in the same session at the same corner. However, for whatever reason, that was his lucky charm, as not only did that get him through to Q2, it landed him P14, ahead of Sonoda, and on race day he was getting stuck in, battling amongst other cars including some slight contact with Gasly, but nothing too serious, eventually finishing in his favourite P14, two places back from Yuki, around 10 seconds away. And so with a good quality and a decent race to boot, 
its back-to-back with a good weekend. On to Canada now and straight into qualifying, which was a little disappointing in P18, translating into a disappointing race. Summed up by this battle between him and Kevin Magnussen, turns 1 and 2, nothing majorly bad, side by side and light contact. Then we get to turn 3, as in an attempt to try and stamp his authority, well, Nick just kind of took them both off the track in this one. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they... Locking up while on the inside line and heading into the runoff, taking K-Mag with him. And by the time Nick got round to rejoining, well, it was a little too late, as he went and ended up last of the finishing drivers, still no higher than P18, as it seems two in a row is the max number of good weekends he can have, given it's back to the bad ones. Now onto Austria in a track that's as short as Nick himself, with the Red Bull ring playing host to our second sprint event, but first off, qualifying. Okay, not the best start, but the sprint shootout did go better, back into P14, seemingly his favourite spot. However, in the sprint itself, could have gone better, slowly losing that P14 all the way to near the back and ending up in the 18th slot. So just the race to go now and it seemed Nick had still not gotten over his battle with Magnussen in Canada, as he well just kinda ran Magnussen completely off the road and into the gravel at turn 6, which gained him a 5 second penalty, with the Dutchman finishing down in 17th place and the only really good bit of the weekend being a decent-ish sprint shootout. So with a poor qualifying, poor sprint and poor race, it's gonna be another bad weekend. On to Great Britain now, also known as the home of British bias, and for Nick, once he was done getting a puncture in FP2, it was on to qualifying, where he took his spot in an uninspiring P19. And for race day, well, uninspiring is kind of the theme, as after having his front wing clipped by an angry Hulkenberg, it was back of the pack for our Dutchman. But sadly, the main issue in this one was the pace of the Alpha Tauri, as although Nick finished in 17th last of the finishers, Sonoda was only two seconds up the road in 16th. So overall, although kind of uneventful, it wasn't awfully bad in Great Britain. And so this time out, it was an okay week end considering the general pace of that car. So next up is, hmm, oh, the, the script, it just, it just ends. As seemingly after 10 races as a rookie for Nick, Darth Horner and Emperor Helmet had made their decision that Nick was to be replaced by the all-smiling Daniel Ricciardo, and that was that. With just a snap of her fingers, Nick was done, with it looking extremely unlikely that a return is on the cards anytime soon. I guess looking at his 10 race weekends then, at a glance, there are five bad ones, one that's okay, and four I'd actually consider to be good. And even the ones that were bad, I'd say that realistically, only Azerbaijan was a completely awful weekend, especially considering that quite often Nick wasn't too far behind Sonoda. You know, it wasn't like his teammate was out there winning races and he was struggling to get out of Q1 or anything. Not naming any names. But on the whole, I would say it was pretty harsh to kick him out the door and to do it that soon. Admittedly, the people that came in, Ricardo and then Lawson, were pretty good, but on the whole, I'd probably say it was a little bit harsh to kick him out the door. But hey, this is the Red Bull family that we're talking about. You know, if they're good enough, they swim, they survive. Anyways, that's all for now. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you did like the video, give it a thumbs up. Make sure to get yourself subscribed to the channel. And until next time, take care.